Okay, well, we're back. Uh, we are back live again. Uh, hopefully, the elevator music has stopped. Um, I There were some moans in the chat um, about uh, it being dead with just a blank screen saying next clinician coming up. So, I, uh, I felt it was better for you guys that uh, you saw the... Um, you, you had some music, even if that meant using the, the Modeler's Life test card. Um, but uh, here we go. We are back over uh, in the United States with uh, Mr. Perry Lamb, who is um, from the Piedmont Division in Atlanta, Georgia. Although you live a little bit north of Atlanta. Um, yes, sir. And Perry has a fantastic Proto Freelance layout. I have seen it with my own very own eyes. Um, and... Um, it is a fantastic layout. It's got its whole whole backstory to the layout that's very well worked out that explains how and why things happen. Um, and Perry's here to do his clinic all about explaining to you how that does. And it, it, you have uh, Shadow, I think, there. Uh, Perry's dog is in on the action as well. And that's cool because just to remind everybody that we are at home providing clinics, not providing – well, we're – we are providing clinics at home to you, not um, not at home, you know, not providing clinics from home. So we are uh, doing our best here, and there may be some interruptions uh, from Shadow, but that's uh, that's all fine. Or Steffi, the other dog. So uh, you are going to go full screen, sir, in just a second, and we will uh, let you go. There you, Perry, you are on. <laughs> Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending upon what part of the planet you're on. My name is Perry Lamb. Um, I am a software support engineer. I support intensive care units um, in all of North America. So as you might expect, what's keeping us here is what's keeping me employed. It's entertaining. Um, I am the division secretary for the, the board of directors for the Piedmont Division. Um, I coordinate our training camp program. We teach Pan Pastels, Model Rarity 101, a whole variety of subjects. Um, it's an interesting division. I, I can start an argument by saying that we're the most active division in North America, and I'll probably get some very angry feedback from that, but that's fine. We can take up that argument later. Um, I am presenting the Utah, Colorado and Western Railroad um, as, a, as contrast to the Texas, Colorado and Western Railroad that I heard about yesterday on one of the um, presentations, a layout tour that was very cool. And this is not um, Lee's Railroad out in Utah, the Utah, Colorado Western without the and. Um, but anyway, off we'll go. Um, I am a s relatively serious model railroader. I, I started model railroading when I was six months old. Um, my dad got me my first train set. It was it was fun. I still have most of it in my train storage room down in the basement. Over time, um, my focus changed, and I started focusing on what was what I could see when I was out rail fanning, and that was modern, real time Western railroading. I grew up out west. Um, I last lived in Idaho before I moved to Atlanta, um, Union Pacific, Burlington, Northern Santa Fe, um, before BNSF, it was Burlington, Northern and Santa Fe. And I liked all of those railroads, and, and but I wanted my own. I wanted a freelance railroad. And over time, the story of my railroad became more and more interesting to me, but it had no history. Um, Union Pacific has history and has its has its um, historic fleet. Um, Santa Fe Railroad and Burlington Northern combined, but they have their own backstories. Even Norfolk Southern and it and its heritage units have a backstory. So I needed to come up with one for mine, and I started working on the history and coming up with what was what happened, how it started in my mind, and then started losing track of the details. So I thought, well, I should just write them down no, wait a minute, I should write them out on a PowerPoint presentation. And the PowerPoint presentation that um, I'm doing now is, or will be doing now, is one that I developed for the 2013 National Convention that was here in Atlanta. Um, and it's, it's the history of my railroad based on 
prototype history from the area in which I model. Um, it covers um, the operational aspects of my model railroad as if it were a one-to-one -one, um, prototype railroad. I, I've studied management and management philosophies for 40 years, and that's kind of an interest of mine, not a hobby, just an interest. And then it also has a splattering at the end of my model railroad, um, very recent photographs of it. It's not a layout tour. We may do that for one of Gordy's um, future virtual conventions um, with his permission, but we'll get started. Okay, the Utah, Colorado, Okay, the Utah, Colorado and Western, there we go, is a major class one railroad serving the entire United States. N notwithstanding the Canadian roads, um, the Utah, Colorado Western is the only true transcontinental railroad in the United States. And I'll explain why shortly. It's headquartered in Salt Lake City, Utah. If I were if I were to retire to some place, it would be there. And it's a privately owned subsidiary of Medical Rescue Systems, a, a large holding company of various activities. The railroad began as a silver and gold hauling railroad in central Colorado, eastern Utah in 1869. Pulling research from the Colorado Virtual Library in 2012 and 2013, um, I, I found the Colorado Central Railroad and I found the Denver Pacific Railroad that actually started in Cheyenne and headed south to Denver. Um, those two layout, those two railroads actually joined on June 22nd, 1870. And that was the initial formation of my railroad. Um, it purchased major portions of the Denver Pacific Railroad in 1874. It purchased the Utah Western Railroad, which really did exist. And it expanded into Nevada and New Mexico in 1880. And that's when it took on the name, the Utah, Colorado and Western Railroad. The railroad at that point expanded into California in 1891, headed east and hit the Mississippi River in 1904. And then it purchased the Western Pacific in 1921. Yeah, we, we really begin to butcher history at this point, real history. Um, for some unknown reason, some photographer went out in 1885 and snapped up, well, you don't snap them then, set up the bellows and set up the flashes and set up a big plate and took a picture of the railroad in Las Vegas in 1885. If you look across the screen right along here, I, I think you should be able to see that. That long band there is the track through Las Vegas in 1885, but for some unknown reason, the photographer got a picture of this wagon and horse team, horse team, and missed a train. Silly photographer. They did better in 1889. Not sure exact. We're not sure exactly where this picture was taken. We did find it in the archives, and this is UCNW number nine in 1889, someplace we think in eastern Colorado. You can kind of tell that by the nothing. Um, this photograph was taken in 1940. This is Utah. This is UCNW 1201. Um, yes, I know someone will probably look at this picture and say, no, it's not. It is a reading locomotive from someplace. I don't care. It's my railroad. This is 3804. This picture was taken as a war bonds promotion in on June 6, 1944. Little did the railroad or the photographer know what else was happening on June 6, 1944. The day was historic, and this picture is, was historic, and this and this actual picture hangs up in the president's office. Um, the locomotive is still in operation. It's it's been re it it's been restored. It it is maintained, um, and it runs currently on the railroad today. But um, but way back in 1944, uh, this was a grand picture. Okay. 
The railroad purchased its first EMD diesels in 1936. We purchased the Cotton Belt from Southern Pacific in 1940. We purchased the Southern Pacific in 1964, just bought it out. We purchased the Denver Real Grand Western in 1980. And we purchased most of Amtrak routes and its equipment in 2001 and 2009. Um, there's a little bit more about that later, but um, Amtrak is now a, a functioning um, money-making operation because it's run like a business, not like a bureaucracy. The biggest thing that surprised people was back in 2009 when the UCNW paid cash for Norfolk Southern. The issue was intermodal trains from the West Coast were headed east and they'd get to St. Louis or someplace near Chicago and disappear into a black hole and never, never to be seen again. And a couple of days later, the trains would continue on their route. Um, but by then, they were really seriously delayed and we got tired of it. So starting early in 2008, we started purchasing um, Norfolk Southern stock in great quantities. By the time word got out, we, we had sewn up most of Norfolk Southern with all cash purchases. And by 2009, we closed out the last of the purchase of Norfolk Southern for cash. And Norfolk Southern is now wholly owned by Utah, Colorado and Western. And we'll cover more of that later. And in July of 2009, this was the symbolic meeting of Norfolk Southern 7202, which had just been re-stenciled, and R9414 out in the mountains of out in the mountains of um, Idaho. Operational departments. The the layout is really a you know the, it, the layout I run like a business. Um, it has its its departments that, um, like most other railroads would have, um, we have uh, intermodal. Uh, that's its own separate independent operation. We have an administrative function. Um, all of infrastructure is its own function. We have passenger services as a function, and then we've got we have a, a function or a department that that manages all of our equipment. It's a very flat organization, and this kind of reflects um, what I've been studying as I've studied management over the past 40 years. Um, most organizations that I'm familiar with are very bureaucratic and have many, many, many layers, and that slows down operations. Can't stand that. So the UCNW is really very flat. There's a president. Each one of these operations has its own vice president. And under that, there are area managers and then crews. So the president of the organization is three layers above road crews. Um, if a, you know, if a, if a manager, if, if a road crew has a question, they take it to their manager, the manager takes it to their vice president, the vice president takes it to me, and that's the end of it. Um, the way it works best is if you look at the concept of a high performance team, high performance teams, you hire really good employees, put them in their roles and say, go do. And quality employees who go and do make you money. And that's what happens here. Major operations, major things that we carry. Um, intermodal, lots of containers, lots of coal, um, finished automobiles, automobile parts, carry a lot of military cargo, chemicals, grain, general freight mer merchandise, you know, what, whatever it is that goes on the rails, we carry it. Intermodal operations, vice president level leadership, charged with the overall conduct of intermodal operations in the United States and internationally. And Intertrans is a subsidiary intermodal service. At some point, I will probably go someplace and get this Intertrans logo turned into a decal. Then I can decal my own containers for it instead of just decaling them as UCNW because I kind of like the logo and it's the only one I've ever developed on my own. But I kind of like it. We are a UPS premium carrier. 
And because of the way we, because of the purchase of Norfolk Southern, we can now make these shipping goals for UPS. 28 hour service, Oakland, Memphis, back and forth and 46 hour service between Oakland and Boston or Boston back to Oakland. Um, we, are a we are a preferred shipper for Pacer Stack Train, we're a preferred shipper for Hanjin, and we're a preferred shipper for MSC. So we, we, we cover all of North America and connect it to the rest of the world. Administrative operations. Um, it has its own vice president. It's charged with overall operations of business, personnel, um, information technology. As a great shock to probably half the people on the planet, there's no union representation within the railroad's employees. The UCNW didn't have any when um, when it purchased Norfolk from its very early existence. Um, when we purchased Norfolk Southern, there were unions, of course, on Norfolk Southern. Um, those contracts were dissolved and um, the employees just fell in with everybody else. Um, they now make more money. They work better hours. They're a lot happier. And, and it's nice. The unions keep trying to get back in and the employees say no. Infrastructure operations has its own vice president leader, vice presidential leadership. Um, it's responsible for track structures, telecommunications, um, PTC with vault, with multiple routes to all trains, both radio and cellular communications between the trains. Um, I, I came up with the idea of a cab mounted signaling system. The, um, the road crews in the locomotives have flat panel displays that project um, the route that the train is on and where signals would have been um, on the main line had they actually been in place. Um, so the, the road crew only has to look down at the flat panel display to see what the signal indicators are for their section of track. Now, at the National Convention in Seattle, and I think it was 2007, at the entrance to the National Train Show, one of the signal manufacturers had a display layout up with a functional signaling system. And my wife and I went into the National Train Show. We stopped at that display to look at it. And my wife said, oh, that's really cool. You need a signaling system on your model railroad. Oh, what am I going to do? Say no. Shoot myself in the foot? No. OK, I'll build a signaling system on the railroad. Thank you. So I have all of the equipment on the railroad, and we'll look at that shortly. Um, I don't have the signals planted yet. One day I will. But um, the, the layout is it's running, it, runs D, it runs on DCC. It has block occupancy in. Um, it's, got the, it's got all of the equipment to drive the signals. I just need to plant them. And that requires an outlay of money one of these days, and I'm just going to bite the bullet, buy the signals, and install them. But in the in the interim, the engineers on their locomotives would actually see the signaling system. But but since I decided to put in the signaling system to make my wife happy, uh, that'll work. Um, the UCNW is the only multi-route double track mainline coast to coast. Um, Every bit of it is double track. There are places where it's triple track and places where it's quadruple track. On the railroad, I've got a section where, um, on the model railroad, I've got a section where the a, a third track is being installed. I, no, it'll never get done, but but it looks interesting. Um, and we we have multiple routes. We've got a northern route where. Um, Great Northern would have run. We've got a more central route that crosses in that crosses from um, the Pacific Northwest down through um, Idaho and Wyoming and and Utah and and wet and and points east. We have a southern route since we took Southern Pacific's um, sunset route, so that all of that belongs to us, and it's all it's all at least double tracked. 
if we look at a map of the United States, Google Maps is absolutely positively wonderful. Um, you can see where major facilities are, Seattle, Portland, um, um, Oakland, Long Beach, Salt Lake City, um, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Denver, Fort Worth, Houston, um, Memphis, Tennessee, St. Louis, St. Charles out of right, St. Charles, Illinois, right outside of Chicago. Never go into Chicago. Trains never make it out. Detroit, uh, Cleveland, um, Pittsburgh, Trenton, New Jersey. So hi, New Jerseyans. We're, we're where you are. And then down here in Atlanta, because that's where Norfolk Southern had a major yard and it now belongs to us. Major yards are in these cities. I mean, major classification yards, Denver, um, Albuquerque, Dallas, or Fort Worth, um, Portland, um, right, or St. Louis, Atlanta, Pittsburgh. Those are the big yards. Major locomotive service shops are in Portland, Denver, um, Fort Worth, St. Louis, Atlanta, and Pittsburgh. So we've got them scattered more or less across the country. There are smaller shops in other places, but those are the big ones. And then we have large intermodal yards um, up in Seattle for the port up there. Um, Oakland, um, right outside of um, Long Beach, uh, Denver, um, Memphis, St. Louis, St. Charles, right outside of Chicago, Atlanta, and Trenton, New Jersey. Passenger services. Um, since we do own Amtrak now, um, we, we're responsible for maintaining all of those long distance routes. Um, the only thing we don't operate is Amtrak California because we just didn't want to deal with the state and the Northeast Corridor because the corridor is independently isolated from the rest of the mainland, from the rest of the routes up there for the most part. And we have no, um, we really don't need to interact with the Northeast Corridor. It runs just fine by itself. There was no reason for us to purchase it and cause it to run on time and make money. Um, so we, we, we ignored it and we ignored Amtrak California, um, but, we, but we operate everything else. Um, those operations do um, continue on the model railroad. Um, and since it's my railroad, I can model what I want. Um, but that's it. We do a lot of commuter operations in cities, um, which is which is interesting to model. It's kind of fun too. Um, we do have the scheme excursion program. That same 3804 is still running the rails today. Um, it's running out on the railroad with class one, brand new modern diesels. And it's fun. Equipment services is the final major department of the operation. Um, it's responsible for locomotives, maintenance of way equipment, rolling stock. Um, we, our biggest, most recent purchases, um, 2500 EMD, now Progress Rail from Electromotive, SD70 ACE T4s. Um, we, we've been using those to replace Norfolk Southern GE units that we're turning back in because we don't use GE. Um, we purchased, we recently purchased another 800 Trinity rail, 53 foot, um, three unit articulated well cars. Um, we also, we also participate with TTX. So we have both our own and we work with TTX and the other major shippers. And we purchased another 450, 30,000 gallon crude oil tank cars. Cause I, that's a busy service for us. We have the largest all EMD fleet in the nation. The only thing that's that's not EMD, we've got some um, gen sets and we've got some leftover um, GE passenger equipment, passenger locomotives, just because we haven't been able to replace them fast enough. Um, our service staff is all factory trained by Progress Rail. 
Um, we do provide locomotive service for other EMD unit owners. We do have a very extensive intermodal fleet and we have the largest fleet of coal hoppers in the nation, especially when you consider that we took um, in all of the coal hoppers that Norfolk Southern um, owned and um, serves Appalachia with. And we haul a lot of coal out of um, the Powder River Basin and out of Utah. There's a lot of coal in both of those areas and we, we carry it. We are the world's largest shipper of military cargo with the exception of the US military itself. We pick up equipment at all major installations in North America. Um, we can deliver it coast to coast and we can even pick up and carry around M1A2s. Um, I'm semi-patiently awaiting an order of um, the DODX 72 foot long six at or six wheel truck um heavy duty flat cars the 41 here 4100 series flat cars they're supposed to be out sometime i hope this year because then i can add them to the railroad additional things that we do we provide ems and fire department grant services i i'm a former paramedic so EMS and fire departments are kind of close to my heart. I was a former paramedic, went to the fire academy, um, and I, I just have a soft spot, soft spot for them. So we grant money to them, especially in our areas of operation. Um, we do have a fleet of helicopters. I know we're supposed to run everywhere by train, but we don't. Um, we provide services for those. Um, or with our helicopters. We can provide and have provided disaster communications and services. Um, we do rebuild equipment for others. We lease locomotives and intermodal equipment, and we do land and resource management. It's interesting because the owners of the original gold mines and silver mines that founded the original railroad back in the 1800s, um, that all of that land and all of the mineral rights fell in with the railroad as the railroad grew and all of that property and all of the mineral rights are still owned by the railroad. And with changes in mining technology and um, um, increases in precious metal prices, a couple of those mines have been, have been reopened or are in the process of being reopened. And so we're also in the business of mining gold. Okay, the railroad itself. The model railroad is in a 43 by 14 foot room. Um, it's double decked. It walk in around the walls. The, the staging yards are stacked on top of each other along one wall. There's a one and a half turn helix that connects the two levels and the total mainline run is about 350 feet or so. Um, I run Lens DCC. I'm the only, well, no, there are two Lens DCC operators in, in um, the Atlanta area, which is kind of to be expected given that Digitrax used to be he headquartered here. One of the members of our operating group um, worked for them. There are a lot of Digitrax users in this area of the planet. And so I have to own all my own throttles. Um, I use Micromark car cards and waybills, but then on top of those, I, I've produced my own switch list. So road crews take their car cards and waybills, mark up their own switch list so they know where they're going and what they'll be switching. Then the dispatcher dictates track warrants out to the operators. The operators um, record the instructions, read them back. Both the dispatcher and the operator approve them. Um, and the dispatcher then tracks the tracks, track warrants um, when they're in use, when they expire on a on a train tracking sheet on a on a tracking sheet for those for those particular trains. Um, it is a double track main line. I do have a helper district built into the railroad. Um, very heavy main line freight operations. Um, Amtrak passenger service. Um, steam excursions, and I'm a um, Santa Fe Super Chief fan. Um, I my family rode the Super Chief from Los Angeles to Chicago back in 1970. 
right before, of course, um, Amtrak took over operations for all the major railroads. Um, and it was class service back then. I, I don't remember tons about the trip, but I do remember it fondly. I remember waking up in the middle of the night at one station stop and seeing lots of snow. But because the train was a Christmas train headed to headed to uh, Chicago for Christmas, there were a lot of kids on the lay on the on the train. And there were, I if I remember correctly, two pleasure domes on the train. And one of the pleasure domes, the kids took over as a kid car. And I remember very clearly being up in the pleasure dome on the Super Chief headed um, headed east. And at that same um, convention in Seattle, the wine dinner train that was up north of Seattle, I don't think that train is there anymore. Someone may be able, may be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but they had a Santa Fe Pleasure Dome. And during the stop, in a, halfway through the trip up at the winery, I went into the car and climbed the kind of semicircular um, stairwell up into the pleasure dome. And I stood there for a moment as I, as I climbed the stairs and I, I've been here before. And I have no clue if it was the same um, pleasure dome that we had as a kid on the super chief, but I, the feeling, the feeling of nostalgia was stunning and I've loved the super chief ever since. And so when Walters announced the super chief many years ago, I bought the entire set. I now run it on the railroad behind um, a matching set of F units and that's on excursion service as well. I love the super chief and the El Capitan cars. And so they live on the railroad too. Um, on the railroad, my lower level staging car, staging yard is um, east. The upper level one is west. There is a division point yard in Salt Lake City. And then there are industrial districts in Salt Lake City, um, Mystery, Idaho, and then the mountains in Oregon and Washington. Um, we have a local, I have a locomotive service facility, division point yard, an intermodal yard, industrial areas, a U.S. Army training facility, um, of course, lots of mountain railroading, and I've got a section of winter, and there was a, um, there were, there have been some things about winter modeling recently in the media, and it's been kind of cool, and I model winter on mine. I took a, took a giant leap one day, and she said, okay, this is what I want in this area. I've got a picture of what I kind of want, and, I, and I'm very pleased with it. I'll show you what it looks like in a little bit. The layout is under construction by members of the North Atlanta Rail Barons Operating Group. I've got my logo shirt on. Um, all the bench work is in. The scenery is about 70% complete. Uh, all the electric wiring is in. Um, equipment panels are in place and wire, and I'll show you what one of those looks like. It's not one of the prettier ones, but it's one of the more accessible ones. Um, the room is nice and completely finished, resets, recessed LED lighting on dimmers. Um, I can kill the power in the room when I leave, just to make sure I don't leave anything on. Um, all of the circuits in the room are on their own circuit breakers. Um, so that's all that's all well done. Um, I had the room wired that way on purpose. I've got a nice finished crew lounge that the crew likes because it's got a pool table and a bar. Um, I have lens, the lens signaling system, lens blocks detection. And then when I get it programmed, I'll have computer aided dispatcher. The dispatcher will be able to sit in his own office and watch the railroad, um, watch block occupancy on a uh, big display and, and operate the layout from there. Um, we feature walk around plug in throttles for the local crews and yard operators, radio throttles for road crews, and then the raid and then the then the dispatcher dis, um, dispatches via radio FRS radio to the operators out in the railroad room. The layout is based on the former, not not the layout that Stephen and Cynthia just demolished and moved, but the one before that, the Emporia subdivision that they had. Um, they had a double deck Santa Fe based layout. That layout had been featured in Model Railroader and in Railroad Model Craftsman. In fact, 
my room finished. I got my room finished when I had the basement um, finished after we moved into the house. And um, I said, okay, now I've got this nice big room finished. Um, I took three rooms, um, took down took down some non-load bearing walls, turned it into one very large room, which you'll see shortly. Um, and I said, okay, I've got this nice big room. What do I fill it with? I need to do a track plan. And the very next month in Model Railroad, there appeared this railroad. Oh, no duck unders, double deck, lots of space to run, um, yard space, staging yards, very cool. Wrote to Stephen and Cynthia, said, can I steal your track plan? They wrote back and said, sure, they've been friends ever since. And this is where my layout gets its plan from. This is their upper level staging. That's kind of what mine looks like. The this staging yard kind of curves around to form the return loops. Um, this is kind of an overall view of one big section of their room. And I somewhere I've I've known the the photograph of the the name of the guy who was operating in here. Somebody will remember him and and point it out, I'm quite certain. But it this is a gorgeous layout. I I this was nice. There, the layout that they just took down, I saw it was gorgeous. Um, giant sigh. No more Stephen and Cynthia Priest layouts, but and they're really good at what they do. Okay, on to the Utah, Colorado, and Western. This is a picture that was courtesy of Brian Sandberg when we started an opera. Uh, a, a, um, advertising program for the Piedmont Division. This is one of the photographs he took. Um, this is part of the town of Mystery, Idaho. Um, I'm a Star Trek fan as well as a Star Wars fan. Um, the town of Mystery was formed, indulge me for a second, when a Borg sphere crashed into Mount LaForge, removed the top of the mountain, and left a big bowl and that's where the town of mystery formed. Um, there's more of mystery painted on the backdrop back here. Um, my wife blended all of the colors as she as we got further and further to the right over here, and you'll see a better picture of that later to match the colors of the painted backdrop with the colors that we were using for scenery. So it blends seamlessly in. It's really kind of cool. Um, but anyway, this is the town of mystery, and we'll go over some of the features of the railroad. This is the vice president of structures and 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 um, infrastructure for the railroad. His name is Howard Goodwin. This is beef. This is when he was younger and could get on the floor. And before he was in MMR, when he was installing bench work on the UC and W as we were building. This is this is that area of the room. He was working over here to the right. Um, this is what the railroad looked like at one point. This is that same scene now. This is the town of Mystery, um, where that train is sitting is in here. The, the painted backdrop is all along here. The colors change as you get into um, the three-dimensional scenery that's here. Um, so this is all of this is how all of that blends together. Um, this is Chirella Creek. This is all microengineering bridge work across here. There are kayakers down in the river down at the bottom. Um, it's, it's relatively nice. Um, these are the staging yards. I've got a better view of that later. Idaho is over here on the left, um, staging on the right. This is the other side of the room. This is where the return loops are in. Um, the staging yards are over here. The return loops are over here. This entire peninsula, this side of the peninsula, and all of this over here is Utah. Um, Idaho is on this part of the peninsula over here on the other side of it. Um, from the previous picture, this is the other side of this peninsula. Um, this is this side of the room. About four days ago, um, this is Shadow, who Gordy, Gordy briefly mentioned, my Shetland sheep dog, who would probably be really well at home where Gordy lives. Um, this is the intermodal facility in Salt Lake City. The um, division point yard is down here. Um, this is an oriented strand board. Or this will be an oriented strand board factory up here in this place in Washington. Um, 
this is all of the scenery that continues along the upper level of the of the second level up here um and and the all the whole purpose of that second level is just to have a long main line run through the forest that's its sole purpose um this is the high desert area of salt lake city the salt lake city depot for my railroad is over here just off to the side of this camera view the scenery that i'm working on right now is at the very end of the um um the upper level down here in the in the big bay window down here and i think i've got a picture of that on here if not you can see it on the nmra facebook page because i've been adding pictures of it there in fact this is it this is where i've been working on my most recent scenery from an article in model railroader some time ago they had a picture they had pictures of a track maintenance facility that they built i kind of liked it and i knew this is what i wanted to do in this area of moose crossing so cody grivno sent me some detail pictures um i looked at those referenced those kit bash this building this is something that i got from atlas or something did some scratch building over to the right and i've been working away on my track maintenance facility in the in the wide spot on the railroad called moose crossing um behind where we were standing earlier um one side of the of the um of the corner of that end of the room is a rather large um construction company with cement plant and all that stuff. And on the other corner is the start of um, my training facility um, and a POL facility backed into that corner. And then these are the upper and lower level staging yards on the railroad. Um, and I'm working on and, and have finally figured out what I'm going to do to finish construction of a town that's in the return loop over on the upper side of the railroad over here. And I'm going to do something somewhat similar to um, the upper level or the lower level return loop that's off to the right off camera over here. Um, I've got my car carts and way bill car cart boxes for both levels of the staging yard. We just stage trains into here. And since they're double ended yards, we can um, restage the layout during operations, which makes it nice. Um, here's a section of Northern Utah. This is actually the, 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 one of the main advertising images for the Piedmont Division and in their literature are our trifold features this on its cover, which is yeah, kind of cool. Um, here is um, 3804 on one of its um, runs through, um, in this case, headed coming out of the helix, headed towards Mystery, Idaho. And here is winter. I I I uh, I knew I wanted a picture of this. I off to the right, off of camera, I have a picture of a Union Pacific mainline um, double track um, and a train running through it through very red canyons. I'm not sure where it is. I have absolutely no clue. The you know, very red rock and very light snowfall over it. Really kind of a cool picture. And I I I've I'd had it hanging next to this this area on the railroad um for quite some time and i was never really brave enough to to jump in and and finish it and and have the snowfall on it and so i finally decided no i need to get it done um built the retaining wall added all of the rock work added the extra rock work and all the trees and all that stuff all around here did all of the ballasting got the scene completely finished all in its beautiful greenery, built a test section, a small diorama, and snowed on it using woodland scenic snow. Very pleased with that, except that when I brought it inside and looked at it, applied the snow outside, fixed it in place with hairspray, brought it inside, and everything was yellow. Mm, not from that. Um, and I thought, this is very strange. And then realized it was because the lights that I was holding it under in the bar in the crew lounge were yellowish incandescent soft white lights. And that turned everything yellow, brought it in here to the railroad room, cranked it up. Um, and under the daylight bulbs from the LEDs, it looked back to white like it was supposed to. So I finished the scene. 
This is not prettiest, but this is one of the control panels. These modules perform both block occupancy and drive signals. Um, this module provides feedback back to the DCC system. Of course, a Digitrax DS64, everything runs out to terminal strips. Terminal strips run out to um, the blocks on the layout. This is all one power district. It has its own power supply, so power comes in, heads out to here. And somewhere in the middle of the railroad, um, I've got a speedometer so the crews know how fast they're going. Okay, Gordy, this is the last of this slide set, so here's the place for questions. I'll drop the slide set and stop sharing. Cool, thanks, Perry. I think that really um, helps people um, understand just how much really goes into uh, doing a, a freelance uh, model railroad. It's uh, it's a lot of work. Y yes, sir. Appreciate you explaining all of that to everybody and showing some uh, pictures of your layout. I'm just having a few issues with Facebook, so uh, if you're asking questions right now and I can't get them um i apologize because i already have quite a few so we'll do quite a few that i've got bob johnson absolutely loves your presentation because he's been firing off hundreds of questions um, <laughs> thanks so which is great um so uh his first question that he put was given that your company is a product of so many mergers have you um have you standardized uh, equipment or do you just have a vast variety of horns and cab designs etc no, and if I, actually, I have a clinic on detailing diesel locomotives, and it follows. So all of my locomotives, all of the current purchase of locomotives and everything that we've inherited all gets rebuilt in the shop, so it all matches the same family. Same cab air conditioners, same horns, um, same rotary beacons, same radio antennas, the, the whole nine yards. Good question. Awesome. Okay. Um, so we will just go to this next question, which was, it's impossible. Well, he said, you can't possibly model the entire US. So why did you choose not to model a smaller railroad that fits a more limited geographical footprint, uh, i.e. an area that you can model? Uh, would that not have made more sense? Well, and to a degree it would. I have two separate branch answers to that. One is, if Godzilla came along and stepped on my house and wiped out my railroad, I'd start again, but I'd do it in in scale so that I could better represent um, the vast open spaces of the Western United States. But I'd do exactly the same thing. The alternative would be to do um, an industrial railroad, and I do you know a 43 foot by 14 foot room with in with in with just industry in it, and a yard would work really well. But I like big time freight railroading. Um, if you actually went and walked the layout, which we might do at a later you know, on a later one of these conventions, you'd see that yes, I have condensed vast vast areas of space of of distance in the Western United States down into a forty three by fourteen foot room. I, it, it's a compromise, but so is all of model railroading. I, I like mainline freight. I like heavy mainline freight, and I like today. And so I just keep updating the layout. But I, I don't have a really good answer for you. Um, I, I I like it. Okay, no, that's fine. But we can keep short answers because we've only got five minutes left. I'm looking over here at you, and you're in front of me, which is a bit daft, but never mind. Um, okay, well, final question from Bob um, was... Uh, Thank you for being such a champion of freelancing. Have you ever taken flack from the rivet counting prototype modelers? No, actually. I, I, I might one day if someone walks in and says, well, you've got like Norfolk Southern's 911 locomotive, 911 locomotive, um, and it's not re-stenciled. Well, yeah, because it's gorgeous. Um, but no, it's my railroad, but nobody has walked in and said, oh, no, you can't do that, which is nice because I would just send them away. <laughs> okay, don't be sending me away. I've got more questions. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, so uh, next question is, how did CSX avoid being swallowed up by uh, your railroad? That was from Jeffrey Youth. I need... <laughs> 
Norfolk Southern was just a better match for what we for what we needed um, to connect our western routes to the east coast. So it was just the logical choice. No sure. particular reason. CSX still exists, and I still have, and I have CSX equipment on the railroad. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Jeff Schultz uh, asks, um, "What did you do for the two years that EMD couldn't supply Tier Four units?" Lots of rebuilding. We have we have a fair we still have a fair number of SD forty dash threes running around the railroad. Okay, that's cool. Um, everyone loves an SD forty. Can't go wrong with SD forty. Um, Dave Goodwin uh, asks. Um, Oh, Dave Godwin, sorry. Uh, your railroad is coast to coast. So is the UCNW larger than CSX and NS? I think this might have been asked before you mentioned swallowing up the NS. So. Yeah, we swallowed it. it. It is far larger than NS. It is far lar Well, NS no longer exists. But yeah, it's larger than UP, larger than BNSF, and far larger than CSX. Uh, on a okay. distance-wise, it's probably equivalent of... Canadian National. Okay, I, I can go for that. I, I, I model the Canadian National, so that's fine. Um, okay, and Joseph Martin asks, are you accepting uh, employment applications for any IT positions? <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, it would, could this be for a virtual uh, op session? <laughs> uh, we, could, we, could, we could look at that. That's fantastic. Well, that seems to conclude all of the questions. Um, someone's suggesting that you need to get some of your models custom rebuilds, rebuilds done just for the uh, UCNW. Yep. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, I just want to make want to end with one comment that people may have missed from uh, Brian. Uh, just missed Brian's name. Brian Ford, um, who says he remembers doing an op session on your layout and getting grief because uh, the passenger trains and the intermodals were not, the engineers were running at less than the speed limit. You were <laughs> running your layout very quickly. Is this to keep the theme, or is this just because you like seeing the trains go fast? No, it's just it's just for the theme. And uh, since then, we've kind of reduced speed limits on the railroad just because it, it kind of helps with the lack of distance. Okay. Well, there we go. That's all the questions. Thank you, Perry. That was great. Really interesting. Something a little bit different for everybody. Um, what we'll do now is we'll just sign off. Uh, everyone, the stream's going to go quiet. There'll be a holding card on there. Uh, I'm not going to subject you to the elevator music for this for for, um, for this break. Uh, when we come back, we will talk to uh, Mr. Tom Gazier MMR, and we will have a virtual layout tour. So stick with us. You've got probably five five to eight minutes to go do a pee break or uh, get a brew. That's a coffee in English. Um, that's not a brew as in a uh, distilled or alcoholic wobbly pop. That is a coffee or a tea or a glass of water. And we'll be right back at the top of the hour with uh, Mr. Thomas Gazia MMR. So thanks, Perry. We'll sign off. We'll see you later. Thanks, Gordy. 